Greetings! Welcome to the devlog for hot dogs, horseshoes, and hand grenades. We're going to be doing something a little different this week, as most of what I've been working on has been bug fixes, so there's not much exciting to show uh, related to that. So instead, I thought I would do something that has been requested uh, a number of times by folk which is to give you a little peek into how a system in H3 works. Namely, what exactly is a firearm in this game? What are its base pieces? How is it set up, roughly speaking, uh, in the engine? How complex does it look? So I thought I would show that to you folks today. So the example that we're going to be taking a look at is uh, our more recently updated uh, beautiful AKM model here. And so let's go ahead and click on this and take a look at what composes a, uh, a gun in H3. So, oh my goodness, look at all those lines drawing over here. So let's, let's turn a couple things off so it's easier to see some base pieces. I'm going to turn off the physics momentarily. Cool. So, basically, guns in H3 have two types or sets of colliders on them. Um, colliders are the sort of base components of the physics engine. They're what allow us to very quickly be able to do comparisons like, is this is your hand touching something? The only reason I can do that is that the hands each have a small collider on them, a little sphere, and objects in the world have them. The ones that are visible here with these green lines are called trigger colliders. So they're not physical, they don't bump into things or sit on top of each other, but they detect the presence of other colliders. So in the case of this, there is the collider for picking up the, uh, the AKM. You can see it's larger than the handle just to make it a little more forgiving. Um, and then a bunch of other trigger colliders that are either detecting another object or detecting the hands. So in the case of this, this is the trigger foregrip that is detecting the presence of your hand uh, as the ability to interact with it. There's the one for the bolt handle there. And then we've got a couple that detect other, oh, and there's, this is the, the magazine release trigger here, which conditionally only turns on if there's a magazine in the gun. We've got a couple other triggers though, that are what is how pieces of, of say attachments detect the gun and vice versa. So in the case of the suppressor mount, we have a small little trigger in here that is detecting the presence of a suppressor when you go to move it up onto the uh, the weapon. We've got one for the Russian style sights that is right here. And then we've got one actually up in the magazine well, if we can find it here. My naming conventions are not as consistent as they should be. There we go. So reload trigger well, which detects a corresponding trigger that is on the gun itself. Now, it's really important for those of you, say, who use Unity or just do game development in general, that most of the time when you're doing complex stuff with physics, the way that you're having to set up your scene, whatever it is that you're working on, is about mitigating the performance cost of the overhead of all of these systems existing, um, especially when you're trying to hit 90 frames per second in VR. Uh, and what this means is that, especially for something as complex as H3, where I have these really complex physics guns, they can you can pile them on each other, you have to architect your entire system to do as little work at any given moment as possible. So, so in the case of all these triggers, they are on a physics layer that only collides with itself. Basically, the, all of the triggers are aware of the hands, and they're aware of each other, and they can't interact with anything else. Otherwise, all of these overhead callbacks would fire every single time. Every time a, a gun hit a table, there'd be like 18 messages that would be sent off, and that, that adds up quickly. So yeah, so everything that's, that's you'll notice in Unity here, I have a layer called interactable, uh, and that's the root layer for all of my interactive objects, um, because the trigger sits on them. All right, and we're back, mail at the door. Anywho, where was I? Oh yeah, so so that's the way that all of the sort of the, the parts of the collision that you interact with are set up. Beyond that, we have another set of colliders, which I are under this heading fizz in my uh, 
in my hierarchy here that are really important and and fair warning this might be a little horrifying to some of you because I'm sure a lot of you have a mental image of exactly how solid and how the physics collision on all of the firearms works. It probably in your head pretty much matches the topology of the firearm and what's interesting is that it's a lot less close than you think it is. So I'm going to move this up here so it's easier to see and make these solid and visible so that it's easier to see. So this is the collision for the AKM. As you can see, it is a good deal coarser looking shape-wise than an AKM. And there's a very specific reason for this. Um, there's actually several. So the first one is that when you're dealing with collision in a game engine, this is running on PhysX, almost everything's running on PhysX, there are, there are two core types of colliders that exist. There are primitive colliders, which are essentially a simple shape that can be represented very, very quickly, arithmetically, inside the engine. And these are basically cubes, spheres, capsules, um, and, and wheel colliders, basically, for vehicles. And that's about it. There are then colliders called mesh colliders. And those are, let's see if I, you know, if I take a look at, no, that's using a primitive. So like this, this environment here is using a mesh collider. Um, that is, it's, it's collision is actually just the geometry shape. And that's fine for things that don't have to move. Um, but for something that you're holding your hand and waving around, mesh colliders have to be convex. So they can't sort of curve in and curve back out again, which can make them challenging to author. But more important than that, they're incredibly expensive, um, just because it's having to do all so much of the calculation one triangle at a time uh, with that mesh. And, and because of that, collisions with them are a little less reliable. And so what this means is that having a, when you've got a complex object like a firearm, um, performance matters a ton in terms of its collision. And I found very early on in the project, I started back, I mean, right at the beginning of H3, I was building very, very accurate collision for all of my firearms. Um, for that first, for that first M4, it was all convex mesh colliders. It was like 30 of them or so to get it really, really accurate to the model. Um, and this was a performance catastrophe. Uh, in more complex scenes. I would I could, would manage to get uh, frame hitches by just holding two of them together and sort of hitting them against each other rapidly or hitting them both against another complex object um, while firing them, meaning that there were sub pieces of them moving. And so around the pretty much the first time I did a major optimization pass in H3 over a year ago, I wanted to see all right, could I get away with a far simpler abstraction? And truth be told, you can. Um, the most important part when you're doing simplified collision on VR held objects is that you can fudge all over the place as long as the critical places where the object might interact with something. The really important, like the top surface, where it would hit on the ground when it rests on things, as long as those are pretty close. Um, most people won't notice the discrepancy at all because it's invisible. And the nice thing is that this is so, so, like, this is the, the entire collision of this object is probably still about at the cost of a single convex mesh collider uh, and is more reliable as a result of all this. So, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that wasn't too jargon filled for you, but that is, it is what I deal with with every single virtual object like this. So let's get on into the, the sort of shooting and configuration part of the gun. So how does all of this work? What are bullets in H3? Well, it's, it's the way cartridges work in H3 is probably one of the, the most complex systems in the game and is one of the reasons why I've had to do uh, as much performance work, uh, optimization work as I have. Before I show you this, I want to put a really, really important sort of disclaimer on top of this. That as a developer, I am not necessarily recommending you do this if you're making a, you know, a game with firearms with it. Um, this is the way that I chose to do things as, as experimenting and in terms of pushing 
uh, the sort of simulation nature of a game engine. Um, it isn't necessarily the fastest or the right way to do any of this, so I just want to put that out there. Um, there. There are certain parts of H3 systems that I show to other developers, and they just go, oh, but why? Uh, so, so there you have it. So let's pull ourselves up a, uh, uh, a cartridge here first. So as you probably know, playing the game, every uh, bullets are always real in H3. You know, most games where you actually have cartridges that are in a magazine or coming out of a firearm, they're displayed basically as a particle um, or as just an instanced mesh, meaning they're, they're there visually speaking, they're not there from a physics standpoint, they're not a real entity in the game system the way a player or even a physics active box is. In H3, this is the opposite, in that if we look at this in the hierarchy, we have the same sort of thing that we have with the gun, and that we've got a, if I turn off its collider here, we've got a trigger capsule for picking up the round, it's got a physics rigid body on it, it's got an audio source on it for collisions, um, it has all sorts of configurable elements on it here, so we have things like object wrappers that are what allow us to duplicate this object. It's spawn lockable, it fits in small quick belt slots, it is 762 by 39, uh, its round class is FMJ, it has a projectile prefab, individual renders that turn on and off based on whether it is a loaded or unloaded round, like so. Uh, some pose offset information that tells the game how to how you're supposed to hold the object and when you actually go to fire a gun in H3 say you've inserted this magazine into the firearm what happens when you pull the bolt back let it come forward and extract around is that the magazine has an abstracted information in terms of what it is filled with we can actually see here it has a default loading pattern of 30 FMJ rounds. So it a round basically gets extracted abstractly from the magazine and spawned into the scene right at that moment and is actually placed into the gun at that moment. So every time you see a chambered round that is in a gun, that isn't just a sort of fake proxy, that's a real round. And the reason I did it that way is that I wanted 100% of all of the metadata of that round, especially if there was something unusual about it. I didn't want to just point at a, just a configuration file for its properties. I would probably do this a little differently now, now that I have, I've, you know, had 15 months of, uh, of, of headaches with getting things working in this project. Um, but yeah, so then when you actually fire it, um, a projectile prefab is instantiated, it fires off, the cartridge display changes to having been fired, and then it is deparented from the gun and ejected sideways, um, given sort of, and given control back over its sort of physics movement. Um, this is one of the things that makes uh, that, that H H3 as expensive as it is. Um, in that these are, these are all sort of like fully featured complex objects at all times, but it's what allows us to interact with them the way we can. So that is a cartridge. So then in terms of the guns configuration, what, what do we have here? Well, I've got several, this is, this whole system is coded via class inheritance. So it's everything inherits from firearm, which incidentally also inherits from physical object, which inherits from interactive object. Uh, in my system, so which means this means that my unity inspectors for my interactive objects are sort of embarrassingly long as you can see here We've got this is everything about being an interactive object a physical object now we're into a firearm So we have a magazine type a round type if it takes a clip a clip type where its muzzle is we've got sound references for the sat firing sounds that it makes its volume ranges um, we've got configurations for taking magazines, configuration for taking clips. We have recoil parameters, which in my system is basically related to the way recoil works in H3, is that there is a sort of a, a total impulse that is, is done per shot, 
and on on the sort of like vertical climb on the muzzle rise angle on sort of horizontal jitter and then linear movement backwards um, and these are sort of maximal values um, there's then sort of clamped maxima for all three of those axes that prevents weird things from happening uh, recovery speed ranges for all of those parameters and then further in script the the exact way that all of those parameters are mixed together is firearm dependent so in the case of long guns when you're holding the foregrip all of the energy that's getting absorbed by you holding the muzzle down of the weapon is coming back at you as linear impulse instead whereas if you're not holding the foregrip the gun just kicks upward um, we have muzzle effect configurations um, for things like muzzle fire and smoke, where they appear, how much, how much does the gas bleed out, etc. Um, in the case of this is a closed bolt weapon, so we have check marks for whether it has mag release, bolt release buttons, fire selectors, bolt catches, where the chamber is, the actual speed of the bolt. So this is, this is another thing that I tell people that sometimes makes them wince, is that there are no animations in H3 in a traditional sense. There's no clips, there's no traditional state machines. So every component that moves on a firearm is just moving um, based upon sort of speed parameters and clamped ranges. And logic within the system determines that movement and then the positions of those components following that movement inform the logic of the system. So it's a feedback loop at all times, which is one of the reasons why you can interact, interrupt uh, certain things in the guns. You can actually catch a bolt handle while the gun is firing, even though that'd probably make your hand bleed, etc. Um, it also is responsible for most of the bucks for the guns because it's it's such a messy state situation. So yeah, so we have that. Um, we have round ejection parameters, speed, rotation, where that happens, um, handling audio, uh, control of all the little individual animated pieces like the trigger, mag releases, bolt releases, fire selector modes, and then some idiosyncratic stuff for oftentimes when, when I implement a firearm and there's like exactly one gun that has an oddity to it, like the barrel reciprocates with the bolt partially, or this one has a cross bolt safety. I will frequently lazily just like add that on as an option into the main class because I can't be bothered to extend it. Um, and so that's why you end up seeing stuff like that at the bottom. So yeah, so that is about uh, the complexity of what is in a single firearm in H3. Um, obviously there's more in terms of like the, the nuance of the way a bunch of this sort of interactions work and oftentimes the way certain things have to be passed off, like if you grab a gun by its firing hand and then grab the foregrip and then release the main hand. I'm in a strange uh, sort of intermediate state where the forward hand is in charge of the firearm. Um, so certain things need to function and certain things don't. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hacky crap in here at this point. Um, this is because H3 went live on Steam in such an early state. This entire project has been a Shall we say it's been like building a spaceship while riding on that spaceship in that uh, any sort of systemic change that I make, I have to be incredibly careful not to ex to uh, upset or damage the sort of existing content uh, that's present, especially because I think we're pretty much over the hundred firearm uh, mark in the game. So and so what this means is that and, and it's why I want to reiterate that uh that what, what I said at the beginning, which is that so much of what you're seeing here in the way that this assembled is not necessarily, if I were to start with a blank slate right now, how I would architect uh, so much of this. I, when I started this project, I, uh, while I had done a lot of physics work, I had never done this complex of held objects before. Um, the last time I had done anything with hand-tracked VR before H3 was like a decade earlier with far simpler systems. So, so much of this has been an, an, an exploration in how to make things work and how to make things run fastest, as well as how to never do things again. Um, as I think that almost every core system in H3, from how I've handled my physics objects to how I'm handling cartridges and firearms, 
um, and displaying that information could be done in a far more robust, scalable, and fast way. But that's just part of the learning process. It's 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 it is a part of being a a, a programmer that you will forever look back at what you did six months prior and 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 sort of and hate yourself for it. So, but it continues to operate well, and most importantly, and this is why. I don't mind some of the ugliness of this system is so much of what I've optimized it around is production speed is the fact that if I get a firearm model uh, in from someone and I have sound effects for it, um, etc. I can bring that firearm online completely in a day. Um, and that's that's the power of the system that I've built for myself with this. So, well, I hope that this has been uh, at least moderately amu uh, interesting, hopefully not too amusing. Um, I know I'm going to get shit from some people about just how long and disorganized my Unity inspectors are, but... Ah, uh, well. I will, uh, so beyond what you've seen here, just to, uh, to let you know, I'm, I've, been, I've been mainly working on bug fixing stuff uh, this week. I'm still trying to fix the damn controller bug. I've pretty much... I've determined as best as I'm able at this point that it's not on my end. Um, that that everything I'm doing is is kosher. Um, I've checked two other APIs in great detail um, in terms of the way that they interface with Steam VR. I've honed out. There were a couple bugs on my end that was causing some of the controller detection issues, um, but I think I pretty much have it locked down. So beyond this point, and this is I'm going to talk to them about this. This. Anything, any errant behavior past this point has to be Steam VR plus the Unity engine itself. So hopefully I can get enough information put together in a repro project to send over to them so someone can take a look at what is happening exactly. Um, yeah, and then beyond that, the other two things that I'm working on right now, as I mentioned last week, is is uh, sound system work and getting working on Mark II of our uh, Wibbly Botworth bots which I will talk about a whole lot more next week. So yeah, so I hope you all have a, uh, a wonderful weekend. I'll be here working as always. <laughs> Peace.